there's something that happens to me sometimes. I think it's Stockholm Syndrome. Like day one or two, I'm sort of like trying to figure it out, like trying to get my bearings, just trying to, you know, do a good job and figure out like what that means. I don't yet know who my like allies are. I don't know who I can trust. And I also have sometimes a tremendous amount of resistance at the beginning to to like any project that's going to require a lot of like emotional stuff because I know it's going to be painful. And sometimes at that point, the director feels like my enemy because they're the person who's making me do it. But usually if I can get through that f first big wall and over to the other side of it, I'm like, I'm in it for life. Like, I'll stick with it till the very end. I'll be like the last person who's trying to get everybody to still get together and make a thing. Like, and once I get over that hump, we're just all in it together. And then the, all that resistance is gone. Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. Lindsay Burge is an actor. I sat down with her in New York City to talk about the work. You land the role, you get the script. What's the first thing you do? Upon getting the script? I mean, I like to read it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I definitely read the script. Um, it depends. So that's fascinating. So <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes if it's like, if you're just a, more, a smaller role, you'll just like search for the character's name. <laughs> this is what Keith Polson said. He said, <laughs> control F. I don't know how to do that, but <laughs> that brings up the find function. Yeah, and then you type in your character's name. If it's a smaller role, yeah, <laughs> and and you know you're busy, you don't have time to, to like you'll read the whole thing eventually. But if you're just deciding if you're going to do it or not, right, you want to just cut to the chase a little bit. I basically want to know what your what your typical process is to get into a character. Yeah, or your first steps toward that. I mean, really, the script, you know. The script is the thing. So I would probably read the script a bunch of times. I actually have pretty good like retention of of a script. So then it kind of like I mean then the the a lot of people do things where they write a bunch of stuff down and yeah. they do this kind of stuff. But like I'm kind of like a an obsessive person in my mind. So if I just if I just read the script a couple times a few times then and then I just kind of like live with it for a little while mm -hmm. and and then it's like whatever I'm doing whether I'm talking to you or I'm taking a walk on the street or I'm going to a coffee shop it's like all like then I sort of that, that the script is kind of just in my mind at all times kind of like growing and and the character sort of like gestating wow. and yeah. then I'm like pulling I'll start you know suddenly it's like I start seeing things like it's like I start seeing signs in the world. Like recently, I'm reading like a, a vampire movie, and yesterday I took this long walk and I just saw there's not this is even in the movie, but there, I saw like a you know piece of wood that was like a stake, and it's just like suddenly I see things. Oh, I see, start cool. yeah. I start seeing the world through yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah. the like filter of whatever movie or or yeah. role I'm like kind of obsessed with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'll, and then I start sort of dreaming about it, and then it's like all the conversations that I have with people in the back of my head. I'm sort of like also thinking about oh, that. Yeah. Um, but I I don't do any of that sort of like pen and paper stuff that that maybe I even learned a little bit to do in college, but I just very rarely do that. I was gonna say like so that like this this kind of intuitive kind of living with like letting it gestate inside you kind of thing is something that no one taught you that this is something you you just do somehow or is it is it is, is it is it like in opposition to what you've been trained i think it's vaguely kind of kind of what i naturally was doing when i was a kid before i had been being yeah. trained and then i came here and went to nyu and had more like you know re quote unquote real training and um but i was trained in in the Strasbourg Institute mostly. Mm. So it wasn't, um, Strasbourg is still kind of like more about pulling things from yourself, like yeah. sort of. So, and, and, and a lot of like imagination stuff. So it's not, it's not so far outside right. of that, the realm of that stuff. Right. 
it's kind of I think they sort of like inform each other but it's not like an opposition to it exactly right right but yeah I guess it is more like you said it is more of like an intuitive thing or a thing that I just kind of naturally do rather than something that and I'm sure the most that that's what most actors are doing. Or maybe they don't. I mean, I've never heard anybody say that quite like that. But but <laughs> this fascinates me because it's like you. It, it sounds like you're not like you don't panic about it. Like you know what I mean. Like you're not you're not like I need to find out what this character. You're just letting it come in, letting it go. You're going out and it kind of comes and you're dreaming and things. Yeah. You know what I mean, like, at what point does the text become? involved like at one point do you you try to connect these things to the text well the text is always involved i mean that's the first thing that you have usually unless it's like an improv movie but also like on the day i find particularly with like indie films and things like this or not like things that are shot on a stage or with a giant budget and whatever it's like so many of the factors can't be controlled anyway that if you or if i it's like I often can't kind of over prepare in advance because, you know, if you prepare for everything and then you show up and then there's this bird who's chirping. Beautiful, beautiful chirping. And that's like something that you didn't plan for. You know, you want to be like appreciative of this bird rather than have it be distracting you and annoying you. Right. Like if I, I couldn't imagine pinning everything down because so much of what happens on the day is stuff that you cannot plan for right you're almost saying like it's almost counterproductive to pin everything down for because of what might happen on an indie shoot i mean that's for me and i definitely see other people who work differently and i see like i see when it works for them and when and i see when it works for me and when it works against me i see when it works for people and against people like it's like um i definitely just like will ruminate on the character and and like kind of obsess about the character and the and the story a lot but i don't usually plan too much yeah i try to like i mean you have to know the lines (laughs) yes (laughs) and how do you feel about that is that something easy for you it depends um i think i have a slight tendency to make the words a little bit more my own sometimes if I don't if they don't fall trippingly off the tongue right. <laughs> um, which it's like sometimes if a I, sometimes I think if a line doesn't feel right it's actually helpful to the character to be saying words that you wouldn't say mm. and it totally depends on the person who's making the thing yeah. some people are very specific about wanting their words and other yeah. people don't care yeah. or would actually rather that you make it like soften it up right Um, right. you know some people are really really good writers but not that many people (laughs) (laughs) most of the time you're just going in like this is not a good writer so i think i could mess with no this. it's like they wouldn't even say that they're a good right you know like yeah, they're yeah, like yeah. I, like so we, like they're happy you're making it kind of better yes like with, <laughs> especially in this new like auteur universe where everyone's an right. auteur it's like right. it's like people are like no i want to make a movie and like so i had to write the script but i don't think that i said like i don't know how to write dialogue you know and then you can feel like okay cool i can I can do what I want with this right. a little bit. But some people are really not like that. They really want yeah. their words. Yeah. And that can be good. That can actually be good because it can get you out of yourself and push you more in like a right. different direction. Right. Now, yeah, this is an, that bird just started when we hit record. Well, that and bird I think wants that that, to be part of <laughs> this podcast. That is not even like a North American <laughs> bird. Like this bird came, like really, I've never heard anything like this. This bird. This is. <laughs> this is. A, this bird is really trying to get known. What is your relationship to the act of auditioning? Just, and has it changed over time? It has changed over time. I mean, somebody told me you're not ever supposed to say this, but. Um, <laughs> I can't wait to hear this. Well, the thing you're not supposed to say is I'm really bad at auditioning. Mm, yeah. um, but I'm pretty sure I am. <laughs> yeah. And uh, my relationship to it has changed years and years and years and years ago when I was auditioning in New York. Um, I just get, I have like a lot of anxiety. <laughs> 
And I would, you know, I would get the script and I would prepare the role and I'd be like excited about going in and um, excited about the character. And again, like think about the character for days and days and, you know, read the whole script, even if it was just a tiny part, whatever, and always get really into it. And then about, you know, an hour before the audition, I would just suddenly begin to be extraordinarily nervous and by the time I would go into the room I would actually basically more or less dissociate I think Mm. like (laughs) um like the nerves of doing it the nerves of like the whole experience of going in the room of waiting in the waiting waiting room you know that whole thing walking in there's strangers they say hi you sit down you start reading and then it's like it's like it would be just be like blank for me and then I would sort of come to at some later point like in the elevator on the street Mm. after and I'd be like what the fuck just happened like and I put in all this time and all this effort and all this preparation and then and then it's just like gone and then it became a little bit easier after I first of all did it more frequently and second of all um like had done something that I think some people had seen yeah and so that then when I walked in the room, I felt this like a shred of connection of like, okay, these, they know who I am. Yeah. They brought me here on purpose, you yeah. know, and like yeah. even just that gave me something to kind of like feel like I could stand on. Because otherwise I was just like, how, I don't know, how on earth do I communicate to these people anything in this like very small window of time and I'm kind of a slow person like I think I am a quite slow person (laughs) and uh and it matters to me so much who I'm with like who I'm working with and Mm -hmm. and all that stuff like like I said like to me so much of acting is your scene partner and like and just the what goes on between the two of you like just mm-hmm. listening to that person watching that person that's how i am as a person too mm-hmm. like i i like to watch i love to watch people and like listen to people yeah, yeah. and so the this whole experience of like you get thrown in a room you're seated, seated across from strangers or relative strangers and then they're like play acting a thing which normally they wouldn't be yeah. they're not the person who's going to be doing that or even anything like the person who's going to be doing that and they're simultaneously like often like kind of you know judging you for better or worse and it's like so like then it's so different from acting it couldn't be more different it's like you have to you have to be so sure of what you're going to do ahead of time that you can like project an entirely different thing on top of Mm. the room and and create a place and all these things and right in order to function properly in there you have to create the facade that you can work in kind of yeah like yeah yeah which i think some people must be really really good at and i just it's like to this day not not my strength occasionally if the if the role is is very like emotional i think it's easier for me um because i can just hold on to that (laughs) and just like and then that's like something to anchor myself to but otherwise there's there's like I i have i have a lot of trouble anchoring myself in those rooms and and I have all this like I have like a lot of people pleaser in me like a lot of actors there's like a lot of people pleaser so you walk in the room and immediately I'm like that woman seems like she's having a bad day that guy seems like you know and like you go into this thing of like wanting everyone in the room to just like be uh comfortable or something which in no way serves you communicating to them that you can like do this role it's like they're not the same thing you know (laughs) so it's just like it's like a complex series of things that happen in a very short period of time. Right. And then all of a sudden you're outside the room and it's like... Um, what, would be, what would be like the ideal situation for you in an audition? Like, like I've talked to an actor who stopped acting because he was afraid of auditioning. Yeah. And he just started auditioning again because of self-taping. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, does that just solve the problem for you? Just being able to sit at home and put it on tape? It depends because, again, it's like, it depends who you can get. It's like, then you have to talk somebody into doing all that stuff with you. Right. And if you talk the wrong, like, I do it often with some of my friends, my best friends who are also actors, but, like, that can be really bad because it's the wrong, you know. Yeah. Then you have this, like, vibe where it's just you and your pal and you're chilling and hanging out and then it's like suddenly you have to lock into, like, being, like, special prosecutor or whatever. And it's like, that's, it's, there's something embarrassing about it. 
Sometimes it's actually easier to go into a room and have there be a person. Like, then you have to rise to the occasion. Right. Whereas with your friend, it might be hard to rise to the occasion, right. like to take yourself seriously enough to be like, right. you know, right. <laughs> to right. do the thing. Right. It can be very embarrassing. But yeah, I think that does help a lot of people, the tape, the taping thing. I think for me, my absolutely ideal scenario is that you like meet the meet a director, talk about the talking about about the role and like that's kind of it yeah, like that's yeah. actually the best thing yeah um because i feel like lots of directors can tell by seeing your previous work and then also just like having a conversation with you if you're going to be able to work well together if you understand like the role yeah. on the similar page and then maybe you might like get something on its feet with them or with one of the other actors or something like that right. like something that feels very organic but the whole extended process of like you know strangers who aren't going to be on set like meeting you in a room and then taping you and then showing that tape to a bunch of producers is like obviously that's like what the system is so yeah yeah you gotta make it work for you or something but it seems very antithetical to the process of the filmmaking that i like at least I didn't know you when I saw a teacher. Like this seems like something that is a perfect, a perfect role for, a, for an actor. Right? <laughs> I mean, is there a more perfect role for an indie actor? Probably not. No. Were you attracted to the like the heavy duty aspect of the material, or was that something you had to like get yourself okay with? The heavy duty aspect, like I mean, just, just like the emotional. Yeah, the emotional. Like I'm talking about, like the last. <laughs> yeah. Half hour of this movie. Yeah, that was. Yeah, that was. I was very. That was something I was very excited about. I like when she pitched the movie to me. It was just sort of the an idea, you know. It was just oh. like a woman having an affair with a teacher. Oh, oh. And I mean, a um, student. student. Yeah. And so. And I was like, great, sounds great, that sounds cool, you know? <laughs> but then, and then we sort of like, um, m uh, over months kind of like worked on that idea. Oh, and then that's interesting. So she kind of like... She definitely like built it around built it me. Around yeah. You. That's so cool, I didn't know that. Yeah, which was cool. So, but then by the time we got, I feel like we shot that movie in like February. And I remember writing her an email in December that was just, it's like embarrassing, but I just remember writing her this email where I was sort of like, I just can't wait to like throw myself into this character. Mm -hmm. Like I just, I really was looking forward to going there mm -hmm. <laughs> with, with that. So definitely that wasn't like, it wasn't like, oh, I have to make myself have this bad time. I was very excited about pushing her into that territory yeah because yeah. that seemed like i saw i saw it as like an opportunity to whatever yeah. have some kind of catharsis about some right. <laughs> deep part of myself right. <laughs> but on set yeah having to keep that level yeah you know like how, how did you do that well, it was a really small production, which helped. It was a really small production where everyone was really, like, all in, I think. It felt that way. Um, and it felt like a very, like, family vibe. Like, I was living with the DP and the woman who was doing my hair and makeup and wardrobe. Like, we were all, like, living together in this house. And, um, you know, it was, like, a no-frills production. It's not like I had a trailer. So I just, it was, like... And we were just in it and, and we were shooting nights. And so it was just sort of like, you you know, you wake up, you're in it, you end the day. I would go back to my room. I would read the script again. Like, that's one other thing about the script is I, I like, after this period of like mulling it over, I definitely, in then when I'm in production, then I like go back to it all the time oh. just to sort of like, Especially something like that where I have to, if I'm like carrying the whole character through, yeah. because I have to keep track of like, well, what did we shoot and how did it actually go on the day? And like, mm. 
maybe I intended for this scene to be this kind of way, but it didn't come out that way. It came out this way. So like now it where do I have to, yeah, yeah, you kind of feel like as you go be like, okay, you're mm-hmm. crossing out like what you did do and what you didn't do mm-hmm. and how to like get to, you know, you may be changing the arc slightly as you, as you go based on what happened. And so then, yeah, I would just come home from shooting all day, read through the script again, pass out, wake up, go back. And, you know, it's like, it's like because of the hours of production, you don't really have time to, with something like that, you don't have time to be like getting out of character and then back in character. Yeah. You just kind of stay, or I just kind of stay in it for the most part the whole time. Especially on that movie, I remember I like lost my phone on purpose, kind of, you yeah. know, like, <laughs> and just like, didn't talk to my boyfriend for a long time (laughs) Uh (laughs) just like that helped yeah because you just kind of gotta like keep keep the thread yeah going yeah and then hope that you can have like a couple months to recover (laughs) afterwards or at least a couple weeks or something yeah but it didn't feel like oh i can't believe i have to go through this at all you know it was like i was totally down We'll be right back after this. Doc, you can ground me if I'm crazy, right? Oh, sure, I have to. I have to ground anyone who's crazy. Then ground me. I'm crazy. You're not crazy. Why not? Catch-22. As soon as you ask to get out of combat duty, you're no longer crazy, and so you have to fly more missions. That's some catch, that Catch-22. Join Peter Rinaldi for a live taping of Back to One with special guest Christopher Abbott, star of the new Hulu limited series Catch-22. Friday, May 31st at 7 p.m. at the Made in New York Media Center in Brooklyn. Tickets are $10, $5 for Media Center members. More info at ifp.org. It doesn't make a difference who wins the war to someone who's dead. I have the honor and pleasure of working with you on a project that we just finished called The Show About the Show, season two, directed by Kaveh <laughs> Zahedi. You play Kaveh Zahedi's wife after she quit the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we actually act in a scene together. Was it only one? I. Yeah. You were there so much of the time, I yeah. feel like. Right. <laughs> I was actually concerned for you in the beginning, the very beginning. Yes. <laughs> I don't think Kaveh <laughs> Zahedi would mind us talking about this at all. I think some people might, but he wouldn't. You mean just day one? No, he wouldn't care. No, I don't think anything. I don't think he'd mind us talking about anything. Of this. No. Uh, it's too hard to go into the all the emotional right. things surrounding this that you had to come into. Yeah. And you, you talked to the woman that you're going to be portraying who left the show in distress. Mm-hmm. So you had an obligation that was different than normal <laughs> shoots. Yeah. You know, you, you had a uh, duty in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of butted heads with Kave in a way mm-hmm. because you weren't just being an actor. Yeah, I had an obligation to Mandy. Yeah, for her side of the story being presented. And, th- and one day this this whole um, story will be told and explained. But I want to talk about a couple moments that I noticed that <laughs> I was like, wow, this is something to learn from. And I think Kave learned from it too. We were in such a run and gun type situation of filming Mm -hmm. but there was one moment where you were literally sitting on a couch we were about to film and that's when he told you you had to cry oh yeah (laughs) it it comes kind of easy for you if you have a little bit of notice (laughs) right it seems like that i guess at this point yeah and my yeah there were times in my life where i was more shut down but now i'm more emotional (laughs) you were mad that he was just that he threw it at me threw that on you at that moment (laughs) but because of the situation i guess it was just like you just rolled with it yeah you kind of had to i mean this project is so different from other projects in so many ways and i just had to kind of like very early on relinquish control because i didn't have a script like all the things we talked about before like i didn't have a script i didn't know what we were going to shoot any day i didn't know i never knew what we were going to shoot and i didn't know what the lines were going to be and so it would just be like, I would just show up and wait for him to tell me what we were going to do. And then he'd be like, okay, you're going to say blah, blah, blah. And he'd give you the line right then and yeah, there. Yeah, and he'd yeah. feed it to me right then and there. And then I'd be like, okay. So so <laughs> there's like, there's not even any hope of preparing. Like, don't, you can't even dream about trying to like right. 
you know, like do what, like know the lines backwards and forwards so that you can play. It's like, no, you're just trying to make the line sound as right. <laughs> natural as possible in on a dime, you know? Right. And also the crazy way that he works, which nobody knows from watching it, I don't think, where he literally feeds it to you <laughs> over and over and over again. Opposite, opposite, opposite camera. Just like, gives you a line a, reading yeah. back. <laughs> it's just like, right. just stand on a, you know, on a mark and say a line. In, it's really hard. <laughs> it's yeah. like, for some reason, it's so hard. And that's what he's having us do every single time. Right. Because he doesn't, you have no context. Yeah. It's not like. Yeah, you're not, the, the scene's not breathing. You're, yeah, you're not yeah, rolling not, into it. You're yeah. not like, it's not like you have, you know, you start here and then you're like, now you're feeling okay. And then you get to the meat of the scene. That's what he's actually going to use. Right. He's just like, stand there, say this. No, that's wrong. Say it like this. You're kind of doing this. I don't know why you're doing that. Like, <laughs> you're just like, okay. It's like what yeah, not to that, do when what, you're directing 101. Uh, <laughs> So, but it's so uniquely his thing that you like. There's no point in resisting. You know, he's not gonna. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. So, right. you just have to go <laughs> and hope for the best. I mean, he's a person who you know he doesn't. I think he doesn't ascribe to the like rules no, of filmmaking. That's right. And he's, I respect that about right. him. He's a brilliant, uh, cinematic genius in my mind. I was a fan before I w- worked for him. Uh, totally, me too. You know, yeah, and. Um, but yeah, like ordinarily, you would know before, immediately before you had to do some kind of crying scene that yes. you were going to have to do a scene where you were in an emotional state uh-huh. and you would know what the lines were so that you would know them. <laughs> so you wouldn't have to be trying to do two things at yeah, once. Right. I don't think it's necessarily intuitive to a person. <laughs> it like takes a certain amount of being able to get outside of your own head in order to be like, oh, right. In order for somebody to get into the headspace to actually portray a person, that it's like that it's not just magic. It's like there's <laughs> act, there actually is like work that sort of goes into it. Right. You know, there's like yeah. layers of of effort and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like like a person. Like we when we did the screening the other day, and he was sort of explained to the audience how it was frustrating because even to have the actors. The, the people playing themselves are inevitably more interesting than the actors playing them, playing mm. these people. The, yeah. act, the actors, it's interesting in, an, in a different way because yeah. you're like, oh, it's an actor playing. A per-. But the person playing themselves is always going to be more interesting. And it's like, yeah, that's because that person has their entire life of being <laughs> them. <laughs> to like build. And that's why actors take a document... <laughs> You know, and like <laughs> they're they're a little bit behind yeah, the other people. Exactly, the, <laughs> the actors are playing themselves. they're behind the curve. Like they they yeah. need to catch up by doing a certain amount of work <laughs> yeah. to fill in. And and like I don't think that Cave really totally. I don't know if he grasps that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if he if he grasps like what is involved sort of in the craft of acting. I don't know that he's like that yeah. interested in it, which I don't blame him at yeah. all for that. I, I mean, also think real life is like utterly fascinating and acting is only like occasionally fascinating. And when the when the two intertwine, there could be something special there. Totally. Yeah. I think it can be yeah. I'm also really into the idea of people reenacting their own lives. Like yeah. Yeah. I think there's something in that that's really cool. When you sat down with Mandy and you knew you were going to play her, were you making like were there were there certain things you were just making notes of like shorthand to use were you concerned about that were you concerned about not just presenting her in the way that she wanted to be presented but literally trying to be this person in a way well like like i said this all happened really quickly yeah so i knew that i wasn't going to be able to do like an accurate portrayal of mandy there just wasn't enough time yeah and Again, I didn't know what I was going to be doing ahead of time, yeah. you know? So it's like, in order to good at, do a good impersonation of a person, it helps to be able to practice it and, like, yeah. you know, work up to it, sort of. And I wasn't going to be able to do that. And it, you even saw me on set become frustrated sometimes because he had in his head an idea of... It's like, I was not only... Pl- I wasn't just playing her, I was playing his idea That's of her. Right. 
which was very frustrating because then I couldn't actually really advocate for her position because that wasn't what he wanted. He wanted his memory of her, which is very biased. (laughs) So it was like, A, I was going to fail at playing her because I just didn't have enough time. Yeah. And B, I was going to fail at playing his (laughs) his biased version of her because like it's not even a real thing and he's then doing like it's like he's then mimicking her and he wants me to mimic my mimicking of her so it's just a mess so I had to kind of like abandon all hope of being um really good at doing Mandy yeah because I just wasn't gonna happen yeah so when I sat with her my main concerns were first of all just making sure that she was comfortable with the fact that I was playing her yeah like Making sure that she knew this, that, that her um, letting me know that it was helpful to her for me to take this off of her plate yeah. <laughs> was really helpful. And, um, and then when I was watching her and talking with her, it's like Mandy and I are also really different, I think. Um, but so I just was like sort of lightly noting the ways that were similar mm. and then also lightly noting the ways that like the the very like easy things that are different like she's i think she's in many ways more dynamic well it's not like like i i'm i'm very dynamic but not all the time like yeah. sort of her like basic mode is more dynamic than my basic yeah, mode i think yeah. like she seems to have a, so much energy yeah and it just like kind of comes out of her yeah yeah um which i definitely like thought about that and i tried that a little but it's not it's not the same. Like I'm, I'm not. I'm definitely not doing. You know, I'm not yeah. doing like a caricature of her. No, and I'm glad you didn't. No, I which is it t- which is rough when you watch it because it's like literally you're cutting back and forth between her and me. I know, but did you? I don't know if you could objectively look at it. I didn't have a problem at all. Well, I'm glad you didn't. I mean, I can't objectively look at anything. Yeah. Um, I obviously was like, oh man, I really didn't think about how much we were just going to be cutting back and forth between <laughs> these two people. It's like if you're yeah. cutting back between Mary and Cotillard and like yeah. actually you need to be off in the same thing, you know, just like scene by yeah. scene. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. it made me glad that I didn't try to do an impression of yes. her. Yes. I think. Yes. Because eventually I just settled into like my version of Mandy. Right. And then I think it's, you do sort of as an audience, you sort of, eventually accept yes and same with the other characters yes i kind of did have to a little bit give up on like i knew that mandy hoped that i would advocate for her yeah and i think i did for like two or three days which you probably remember (laughs) yeah but eventually i had to kind of give up on that and i had to be like this is not mandy's show this is kave's this is kave's story yeah and i and like I am not the person to tell Kaveh that right. I, like I, I'm really here to serve Kaveh's story right. and to try and like I I don't think I made Mandy look terrible no well, yeah because otherwise there's no winning like there's no way you could win that the, the mm. only thing that would happen is Kaveh would say all right well I'm sorry Lindsay this isn't working you're done <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean that's it that's it yeah. it's not like you can <laughs> conquer the show only Mandy I thought yeah. Mandy could actually conquer the show if she stayed in it absolutely and change the whole thing and she kind of she was very close to doing that but yeah. then I think she conquered the show so much that she like conquered her own need to conquer the show which was Ooh, that, which is yeah. like a real that's like her, she really won in that, that scenario yeah, yeah, I guess you're right <laughs> yeah in a way yes this I is hard so. to understand for anyone who hasn't seen the true. show true but maybe they're seeing this after it is a a worldwide phenomenon <laughs> <laughs> uh, at one point the scene got over that we were filming and Kaveh said does anybody have any suggestions on how to oh yeah yeah I remember that yeah. so it's a director asking everyone <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for suggestions yeah. on how to make it better yeah 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 it's like I think if this were the approach of filmmaking and it was more normal, then it wouldn't feel so bad, maybe. Yeah. But I think the reason why we do have a director, <laughs> and I think I, I wound up explaining this kind of to Kave. Oh, you did, yeah. Didn't I? I don't know. I don't remember that. It's like, it's like the, it kind of almost goes back to what we were saying about an audition. It's like, in order to make yourself really vulnerable, which you have to do when you're acting, there has to be somebody there who you trust, or at least for me. There has to be somebody who I trust, like either my scene partner or my director. Yeah. Usually it's one of those two people. Yeah. 
you know, ideally it's both. Because you have to make yourself really vulnerable. And, like, I'm not a total psychopath. I don't want to make myself vulnerable in front of everyone and complete strangers. Like, you need some place where you feel safe. And so the director becomes that person. That that person you you hope is, like, looking out for you and has your back, is going to, like, call cut when they should call cut, is going to, like, choose the parts of the scenes, you know, that work well to use in the edit you know you want to really feel like that person has your back they're the person who says that was a good take that wasn't a good take try this try that and when they suddenly open up to everybody (laughs) it's just like oh this is a free-for-all now like now i'm taking criticism from everybody it just it's it doesn't feel and it no longer feels like safe kind of and you're like, and you sort of then begin to question if you can trust that person, if that person doesn't have, you know, right. if that person can't tell what's what. Right. And it's like, it's it's one thing to like, I mean, obviously on lots of sets, the director is actually taking notes from a ton of people. There's like a right. room full of writers and right. producers who are whispering over, you know, yeah. the whatever, walkie talkies about what they want, what they don't want. But it still comes always through that person. Right. And it's like, it's for that. It's done that way for a reason. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think an actor feels super safe thinking that there are just a million eyes on them all judging and having their own opinions, right. you know? You kind of, like, you think about this one safe person mm-hmm. and then you think that person has your back. And that mm-hmm. makes it possible to sort of, like, reveal yourself. I but it's weird. It. Like, there's something that happens to me sometimes. It's almost like, I think it's Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> Where, yeah, like day one or two, I'm sort of like trying to figure it out, like trying to get my bearings, just trying to, you know, do a good yeah. job and figure out like what yeah. that means. I don't yet know who my like allies are. Mm-hmm. I don't know who I can trust. Mm-hmm. And I also have sometimes a tremendous amount of resistance at the beginning to mm-hmm. to like any project that's going to require a lot of like yeah. emotional stuff yeah. because I know it's going to be painful and so there's all this resistance that comes up at the the front and usually and sometimes at that point the director feels like my enemy because they're the person who's making me do it in this this is probably like you know my my therapist should help me figure this out (laughs) my like authority problems but um but then like so i'll hit this huge wall of resistance and it may happen privately often it happens privately or it may happen as it did in this case on set because of our very unusual style of working yeah. and um but usually if i can get through that f- first big yeah. wall and over to the other side of it then it's like i'm like i'm in it for life mm-hmm. like i won't I, I'll stick with it till the very end. I'll be like the last person who's trying to get everybody to still get together and make the thing. Like, and, and usually from that point forward, like, like I feel so um, bonded with weirdly with the director and the other people who are making it that it's like, like once I get over that hump, we're just all in it together. And it, and then, and then the, all that resistance is gone. And that's probably the point at which I gave up, like, slightly gave up man trying to tell yeah trying to like you know yeah gave up that aspect of the duty yeah yeah because i had to like come all the way over to kave's side right. and be like okay i'm on your team we're telling this story right i'm 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 with you i don't hate you yeah you're not my enemy we're like yeah. gonna do this together and then after that it, like every day that we had to work together it really became a project that i was really I felt very attached to and committed to. I want to know what your assessment of this business is right now. And, but more on the level of like, has the frustration with it outweighed the pleasure or maybe the pleasure is the wrong word, or the satisfaction, Mm -hmm. the artistic satisfaction. And if it hasn't, like, why is that hope there? Still alive. (laughs) (laughs) Why is the hope still alive? This is a very dangerous question you're asking, (laughs) Peter. (laughs) No. (laughs) I don't ask this of everyone because 
I think I think you are alive. Like yeah. I think I think you have an alive art, and I'm worried about your kind. You know, in in the in the business. You know yeah, I mean? well, like, yeah, yeah. I think it's I think that it's a good question that you ask, and I think the answer would change. You know, from day to day, and that's kind of the that's like the main thing about this job, is that you never know what's coming next and it's like it really is just kind of a roller coaster ride and just being able to take the ups and the downs and like just make it through the downs so that you can get to the ups kind of mm-hmm. and also not get too like carried away with the ups because knowing that it'll always come back down it's just like mm-hmm. it's just a flow and you don't know where it's going <laughs> and so I don't have a short way of answering it. It's like sometimes I'm very discouraged and think I should be doing something else with my life because I think that I have was given certain gifts and I don't know that they're always being utilized. Uh, Or I wonder if it's like the most effective, if it's the best way for me to be most effective and most useful in the world. Mm -hmm. Like I definitely think about that a lot. And then other times, and it really depends if you're working on something that is exciting to you, or to, if I'm working on something that's exciting to me or not, like how satisfied I am. Um, and it's really the, ti- the times between projects that can be really confusing. Because that's when you, it's like you go through this whole like death rebirth period where you're like <laughs> letting go of whatever you were just playing and trying to like figure out who you are again and then waiting seeing trying to like evolve a little bit so that you can do something different in the next thing and it can be those are like the kind of like murky zones Mm -hmm. (laughs) but i feel like so long as and this is the same for a lot of my friends also who do the same kind of work it's like you know obviously we're i'm not like an a-list celebrity i'm not like my phone is not ringing at all hours to do like highly lucrative things um but in many ways, I like I'm very lucky because I get to I still get to like live. I still get to be a human, which I really value. And. And I think I'm allowed to I think I'm allowed to evolve as a person in between the things, which is really helpful because I don't want to play the same thing over and over and over yeah. again. It just wouldn't do anything for me. Um And I want to be able to work on my own stuff and my own writing. And you can't really do that if you're just like on a talk show every single day. (laughs) So long as there are still new things coming, like new projects coming, and those projects are interesting to me in some way, then it's still alive, you know. And somehow things just do keep coming. (laughs) If you can just like be patient and wait and not lose your mind in the interim. Creators are always out there coming up with new ideas and responding to the world and how the world's changing. And, like, so long as you can just (laughs) keep um, the audience can't hear me, but I'm making, like, a gesture of, like, a a rodent. Are you going for a hole? (laughs) Are you you a mole? I think I'm a mole. Oh, maybe I'm on a... Climbing a little mole? On one of those wheels. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Maybe I'm crawling through a tunnel. So long as you yes. can crawl through the tunnel. Yeah. <laughs> you're you making your own hole. Light. You're making your own hole. You do have to make your own hole. Because you don't, I don't, I find myself continually, yeah, it's true. At the end of each phase of productivity. You're just walking like a rodent's no. walking through a hole some, somebody else made. It's true. And you, and it's not like I'm like picking up a map and looking at the route that was presented to me. It often is very confusing. It's like, where on earth am I going? But you just keep pushing forward. <laughs> and it's always, it's, it's always surprising because then suddenly you break through into the light and you're like, oh my God, I just literally did not know that there was going to be a new phase of this. Like, mm-hmm. I really didn't know. Mm-hmm. And, and then there is. Lindsay Birch, thank you so much for this. Thank you. Back to One is a production of Filmmaker Magazine, which is a publication of IFP, the Independent Filmmaker Project.
Listen to back episodes of this podcast at filmmakermagazine.com or wherever you get your podcasts.